you can have the seats. We certainly praise God for you and are grateful to be gathered with the saints and friends here at the Center of Hope. So I'm beginning a brand new series today, and it's entitled This Is Us, if you haven't already figured that out. And part of my attempt is going to be to unpack a little bit about why and who we are. The fact is, each and every week on some level, you interact with this ministry. Maybe just on Sunday, some of you are involved in more than just Sunday ministry, but you're involved in a larger group or collection of people that have a very distinct call from God, and we are on a very specific mission. And, and this mission kind of begs certain dispositions. We have to think certain ways and believe certain things. And part of what I think is important for you as being a part of our fellowship and a part of our family is that you be informed about what makes this place unique. Whenever we do the backstage pass and people come by as one of the staff by my office, I always kind of do a similar speech for them. And part of what I say to them is this, is that we're kind of like other places in a lot of ways, but we're very different. And it's always my hope that you're able to understand what makes us unique. Because I believe it's that thing that God has called us specifically to that allows for us to have the most fulfillment and truly be able to measure our success. The fact is we don't quantify, you know, our success or qualified in the context of what someone else is doing, but we try to make sure that we are living out the best version of what we heard God show and say to us. And I want to say to you, family, I don't know what you do for a living or what your life script is, your career, your passion is, but never compare yourself to other people, but, but compare yourself to what you heard God say about you. Try to be the best version of God's ideas concerning your place and your purpose in this life. Because the comparison trap is very sticky and it keeps you from actualizing the promise of God concerning you. But when you know what God has said to you and you play that position, you find yourself being able to sleep better at night. You find yourself being able to live a more thoroughly complete and robust life. So I want to talk a little bit about those things over the next four weeks, and there are four distinct areas. The first is connection, and we'll cover that today. But not only connection, but it's also evangelism or invitation. That's inviting people into our family. Thirdly, I'm going to talk about service and the ways in which we can commit ourselves to be about the success of other people. But last, I'm going to talk about generosity. I want to talk about the fact that we are a generous church, and that is kind of manifested in a number of ways, not simply in dollars and cents, but in our time and the allocation of our resources to the benefit of someone else. But then I want to talk about connection because it is the lifeblood. It is, it is the heartbeat of this ministry. In fact, as Sister Joanne said in the video earlier, it's the way Jesus understood ministry. He understood ministry within the framework of being connected, being in proximity to other people. Now, all of you at this moment are sitting in a row or in a pew or on a chair next to someone else. And so, for, you know, by virtue of just being in this place, you're in proximity to someone. But it's not just about the physical proximity. It's not simply how close you are to a person in, in the physical construct. But it's also about how close you are to a person in relationship. I believe for the church to be what God has called it to be and for us to live a fruitful, beneficial life, we've got to have relationships and connections. This life was never meant to be lived on its own. You are not an island, and sometimes the enemy will try to tell you that you can't trust anybody, and you've got to go it alone, and you've got to protect yourself, and you've got to build up walls. But that is Satan's plan to divide you and to keep you from having a solid connection because his trick is to find the people who are off to the side and pick them off. Are you sensing what I'm saying? So several months ago, me and my staff went to a conference and we had the chance to hear a lot of great teaching and a lot of great instruction. And one of the things we came across was this concept called murmuration. And when I heard of the concept, it was a new word for me. I had never heard the word before, let alone the concept. But as the gentleman began to unpack murmuration, it had such epic proportions, I thought it would be important to share it with you all to kind of explain the ways in which we understand connection in this house. See, murmuration is something you've probably seen before but didn't know its name. It's when a collection of birds called starlings begin to paint this beautiful picture in the heavens. 
It's when this flock of birds uh, being attacked by a predator begin to coalesce, connect, and they release their individualism to become part of this larger being. And it looks like an amoeba in the sky. It's probably one of the most beautiful scenes you'll ever see as these birds wave in and out of form and structures and you see them taking on various shapes. It's amazing to see how quickly they can turn on a dime and they spread out really far and then come in really close. It's an amazing sight. But this amazing sight is not simply something that is the making of the beauty that God is so known for, but it also shows a deep truth about what it means to be a part of a larger group of anything. The fact is, these birds do this oftentimes because they're being hunted by a predator. What they realize is that if they can coalesce and come together, they stand a better chance of being successful in the face of an enemy that would take them over. Now... There are four things I want to show you about this murmuration, and then I want to read you a passage of scripture and give you some context for what happens here at the center of hope. The first thing I want you to see about murmuration of these birds is that these birds are answering the call to continue and to live productively. See, life trying to avoid danger is not simply being out of the way of harm's way. But it's, I believe, the idea that because God gave us a command to be fruitful and multiply, that anything that would stand in the way of us accomplishing that call has to somehow be met with some form of resistance. These birds have ancestors as we do. And they all, the ancestors that came long before these birds arrived, heard a word from God that they were to produce after themselves. In other words, they were to survive. And so these birds have found a way through creative mechanisms to continue. And I would suggest to you that in your life and mine, more than us avoiding the dangers of this life, avoiding the enemy snare, the fact is we live to be productive. I don't know about you, I don't just want to survive. I don't just want to be here. I don't want to avoid danger and avoid near misses, but I want to have a life of productivity, a life that is full of zest and of zeal. I want to reproduce something great. I want there to be a lasting impact of my life once I'm gone. Is there anybody in the building besides me? But number two, what we know about these birds is that they have identified a common enemy. See, when these birds come together and begin to to flow and to form into this beautiful array, what they're doing is this. They're saying, I'm going to connect myself to these other birds because there is a common enemy and this other bird is not him. The fact is, one of the things that helps any organization or group to be successful is its ability to identify the real enemy. See, Satan is so clever because he tries to convince us that the people sitting next to us are the enemy, that the people on our row are the enemy, the people in the household of faith are our enemy, but the fact is there is an enemy of your soul, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power and spiritual wickedness in high places. See, when these birds understand and identify their common enemy, they can do a better job of connecting with each other to make sure they avoid all the things that would befall them. Is there anybody here? that's ever been in a season where you had to get with some other folk that identified who was really the problem and you began to pray and seek God and y'all weren't fighting each other but you were fighting the enemy of your soul. Is there at least five witnesses in the building? But here's number three. These birds ceased to be independent but became a new creation. See, I want you to understand, this is not the absence or diminishing of individualism. It is the absence or diminishing of independence. Now, not for the purpose of codependence, but for the purpose of interdependence. You gotta get this. See, sometimes we can go from independence to codependence. That's not healthy. But when you understand the power of interdependence, it means this, that I take all that I have and all I possess, and then I connect with someone else that also has something to offer, and we then also offer to each other the things that we possess. That's interdependence. Codependence is when Nene keep calling you for money and she never pays you back. That's codependence. Stop answering the phone. Tell Nene figure it out. She will if you stop lending her, lending her money. 
Okay, anyway, all right. So my point is this, that part of what these birds have learned to do is to connect with each other, to realize they are better together, to understand that they have to connect. In fact, it's amazing when these birds, they've studied these birds, they still can't figure out how these birds have such a high rate of reaction time. But these birds can turn on the, on the drop of a dime because they are connected one with each other. It's as if one bird from one place, they, they call it scale-free correlation, meaning that a bird all the way, maybe a few thousand birds over, can make a change or an adjustment that impacts the rest of the birds, and birds that are nowhere near the first bird are doing movements that correlate with the first bird because all the birds are connected and interwoven together. Is there anybody in the building besides me? The fact is, when you learn that it's not about you being independent, but you being interdependent, there's a way in which you can live that can, to the benefit of people, impact them, and they are far from you. Is there a witness in the house? But last but not least, this is an interesting phenomenon. They are aware of and are responding to the six or seven birds right around them. The interconnection is spread across a collection of smaller connections. That's a lot of C's and X's in that, in that sentence. Here's the point I'm trying to make. When they study these birds, what they realize is that a single bird is not paying attention to the entirety of the bird collection. But this single bird only has to be aware of about seven birds around him. And when he is aware of those seven birds around him, when one of those seven makes a move, he adjusts to accommodate that bird's movement. Well, what happens is this. When that bird, come here, Pastor Kurt. When this bird right here is of one of my seven, come here, uh, uh, Elder, um, uh, you know your name. Come here. Come on. I'm sorry, Elder, Elder. Usury. Uh, Usury, thank you. All right, so, so and, and would you join us right here on the stage, please, right here behind her? So what happened is, so, so and this, this is a very crude example, but just follow what I'm trying to say. Uh, my focus is only on this bird right here. So when this bird starts pop-locking, <laughs> all I have to do is pay attention to the bird, that y'all, y'all in trouble, I'm saying right now. <laughs> pay to the bird that's pop-locking right here. Now, this bird can't see this bird. But this bird can see me. And when this bird sees me, this bird starts pop locking. And this bird is pop locking with this bird pop locking. But this bird can't see this bird. But then the bird next to this bird sees her pop locking. Now she can't see me and she can't see the bird that I can see. But this is scale free correlation that a bird over here is changing the life of a bird over there because everybody's paying attention to the bird that's right next to them. Is that making sense to y'all in the house this morning? Thank you so much. Your grandchildren are going to love you because you popped lock in front of the whole congregation. Give them a round of applause, y'all. All right. Go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to read verse 12 through verse 31. And then I'm going to pull out for you just just four ideas about how this community works. All right? Because community and connection is not easy. It doesn't, let me say it this way. Within the programming of a fallen society, it does not come easily. Right? Of course, as far as God's original design, it is hardwired into our systems, but the fallen, us being born into sin, has disrupted God's plan concerning agreement and unity, and it's hard for us to be in agreement because the enemy has so infiltrated our systems and our structures. Is that making sense to you? All right, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, watch what it says. Just as one body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Somebody shout one body. body. Whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Verse 14. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. 
Not, now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has place. Somebody shout, God has place. Come on, God has place. The parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body, 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are, are, are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are uh, um, unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body. Say no division. Come on, no division but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. Come on, y'all. If one part suffers, how many suffer with it? Every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gift of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gift, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. This conversation that the Apostle Paul is having, in essence, is, I believe, in, in response to some schisms and some breakdowns in the community at the time that he is writing this letter. And the fact is what Paul understood in this moment and what you and I are very aware of, that if you get more than one person in the same place, you're going to have some disagreement. It's just the way it is. The fact is that you and I, when we get together, we see things from different vantage points. Now think about it like this. The kingdom of God, you and I as people of Jesus Christ, were always designed to operate within the context of God's desire concerning his kingdom. And here's what I mean. Thousands of years ago, Jesus says to his disciples, look, upon the rock of Peter's confession, I will build my church. And he says this, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, what's interesting about this framework is that it really points back to what is said in John chapter 1, that the light shined in darkness and the darkness could not extinguish it. Here's what that means, that what God was presenting and developing, the called out ones, the, the gathered ones, the people of God, he was saying this, to the extent that I have birthed them, there's nothing, not death, not hell, not sin, not Satan, that can extinguish or stop what I have created. The fact is that God always had an idea concerning his family, and no matter what would come its way, and if you ever learn anything about history, you know a lot has come the church's way. Dark ages, the enlightenment, so many things, the, the times of Nero and times of Agrippa, even in the beginning, there's so many elements that have taken place trying to break down what God was creating, and to the extent that the people of God held fast to their confession of faith, gathered together, it continued even in the hostility of the barbarians and even other, other times in our history. The fact is you and I are here because people banded together to keep the faith alive. And, and if we're going to continue to do what God has called us to do, it's going to require for us to remain together. The kingdom is not born or, 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 or carried just on the back of, of high people with collars and ordained elders or bishops or apostles. But the family of faith, not an institution, not a structure, but the people exist because you and I are here. You and I are the church of God. It's not an idea or a concept. It's not ethereal. It's real life, actual people. And as we understand our place in this world and our connection to each other, we find that the church can contend with every foe. Now, here's what I want to say to you. This is the reason that the enemy works so hard to break us down. This is why he tries to introduce all sorts of division and schisms and ideas. You know, he's the architect of chaos. 
He's the father of confusion. And so he whispers a word here. He intimates an idea there. He raises an eyebrow here. He, he tries to divide us along the lines of our skin color or occupation, our age or whatever other things that might divide us. Satan is so slick, he knows that if he can divide us, he can conquer us. I was talking with Brother Eric between services. He mentioned the fact that when a lion is chasing after his dinner, he finds a group of animals and he looks for the weakest one that's kind of trailing apart. And whichever one is not connected to the herd, he hunts that one down, the, the weak one, the, the young one. And the fact is Satan does the exact same thing for you and me. And this is why it's so important for us to be connected because the enemy is like a roaring lion looking for who he can devour but you and I have been given to each other as a gift to preserve the continuity of our fellowship. And there are people among us, I believe, who are trying to be snatched from our hands. But if we as the body of Christ will band together, lock arms and put our chest out, obviously we can beat back any enemy that wants to take our children and those who are feeble among us. Now. In this conversation, the Bible says the Apostle Paul begins to talk about this diversity of elements in this many parts of one body. And here's point number one as relates to this context that the Apostle Paul brings up. He says this, we are formed of one new body. See, this is what murmuration is like. In fact, when murmuration is discussed, this flock of birds, it's more like physics than it is biology. They call it transition physics, kind of like when water turns to vapor or metal turns to magnets. The fact is that these individual parts then become a brand new being. And in your life and mine, the Bible is teaching us that when we become members of the family of faith, we no longer cease to just be individuals, but we are individuals interconnected into a new body. Now watch what this means. That means stuff can't always go your way. See, if it was just about you and it was just you, then we would have this church just how you wanted it. That means every song will be the song that you wanted us to sing and all the colors will be the colors that you wanted us to choose and all the things and the temperature will be just, just right. Lord, I wish it was a little bit better in here right now. The fact is, when you are an individual that's not interdependent, then all the things that you do are to your liking. See, you're raised like that. You're raised to honestly be a little bit selfish. You grew up having things the way you want them. You want to eat a certain place, you got what you want. You want to do a certain thing, you did what you want. Most of your life. This is why marriage can be so difficult. Can I pause parenthetically for a moment? <laughs> the fact that what makes marriage so unique is that you live with someone that doesn't agree with you all the time. <laughs> Not negative, they just see it a different way. You want the temperature at 78, they want it at 72. You like a harder, firmer bed, they like a softer bed, right? All the married people got quiet because you don't want to get in trouble. It's all right. The fact is when you are living and in fellowship with someone else, it ceases to be just about you. But you're part of a bigger picture. And so you can't have everything just the way you want it. Are you following what I'm saying, family? You are born into a new body, and if this new body is going to work, we're going to have to put down all of our shoulds and coulds, and it ought to be, and it ought to this. And we got to put that stuff down and say, hey, what's going to help the body continue to thrive and live in the place that it's in right now? The fact is all of us have things that we would like a certain way, but the question we have to ask ourselves is this, is what we're doing and what we're believing and what we're coalescing around something that makes sure the body is sustainable in every season it finds itself in. Because if we're trying to do a thing that only serves us and doesn't serve the future of the body, we're working in cross purpose with God's plan and his desire. But every single bird that murmuration cannot do what it wants to do and go where it wants to go. But but it's got to play its part in a broader scope to keep that body of birds from getting eaten by a hawk. Preach, Pastor Jeremy. Here's number two. Number two is that every part has value. 
and is set in place by God, not just what, but where. The Bible says, God says this, or Paul, Paul says this, look, God sets in the house or in place in the body the parts that he wants where he wants to. So watch this. Every member has a gift and every member has a place. I'll say it again. Every member has a gift and every member has a place. I'll say it again. Every member has a gift and every member has a place. I'll say it again. Here's what I'm talking to. If you're in this house and you've been coming for a while and you're not using your gift and you haven't found your place, we've got some work to do. Because every person under the sound of my voice that is connected to this house ought to be operating in their gift and serving in their place. There is too much work to be done in this community and in this context for us not to all be linking arms together and giving this world what God has given us. If you think for one minute that I had the capacity on my own to lead this house and to change this nation, you and I have both lost our minds, but God has assembled a collection of intelligent, gifted, amazing, anointed people, and God is saying this, he never called one man to do anything, but God has called us all to participate collectively. God has got a place for you in the house. You better come on with me. I'm trying to preach to y'all. God has given you a place in this house, a place to serve, a place to give, a place to participate. And if you are not actively involved, you are robbing God and you're robbing us of all the things that God has placed in you. Y'all looking real uncomfortable now. But I know I'm right. I know there are people I could never touch, that I'll never reach, that I don't have the capacity or the style that will, that will minister to them, but you've got it. You have what I don't have. You have techniques and tools and life experiences, and you've got a place, and the body of Christ needs you. Serving isn't just about you. Serving is about us. We're waiting on you. We're waiting on you to step into the place that God has handcrafted for you. Here's what I believe. I believe there's some things that won't get done unless you do it. There's some words that will never be released unless you say it. There's songs that will never be sung unless you sing it. The children that will never be mentored unless you step up and do it. And I know that you look at the great people that we have, our wonderful deacons, our incredible ministers, and all of the people that serve here now. And you're saying, you know what? They're doing a great job. They got it. They tired. They have been serving and giving. I was talking to Sister Barbara Parker the other day, and she's like, look, I took care of my family, my children, this church. I'm going to sit down. Because she, she's given, she's given her life and her love and her affection and her time and her money and the ministry. She's given it all. And we need more people who know that God has touched you, transformed you, cleansed you, brought you out. And you got the nerve to hold back what God has placed in your life. Who do you think you are that God can make that kind of investment in you and you're going to sit on your gift and not give nothing back to us? The devil is a liar. Oh, this is going down hard. I must be talking good. Everybody's got a place. Everybody's got a gift. And if you don't know it, that's okay. We can discover it together, but I need for every person in this house to know that God has not called you to be a spectator. A part of what makes co connection happen is when all of us give what we got to be a part of the solution. The Bible says in the first few chapters of Acts, when it talks about the early church, it says they all shared in common what they had and none suffered lack. Certainly, I believe that has to do with material goods and things monetarily, but it also had to do with, I believe, intellectual know-how. Had to do with understanding that when someone was down, someone else had something positive to say. 
that when someone was weak, someone else was strong enough to carry them. And the fact is each of you in this house have been the beneficiaries of someone who invested in you, who served you, who carried you, and now it's your turn to carry somebody else. Here's number three. Put it up. Number three, we appropriate value to all that there should be no division. Paul, in this conversation, goes to a lengthy kind of discourse on the fact that those that are, you know, uh, modest, you know, or, or the, the more representable parts don't need as much covering as those that do need, that are, that are more, you know, not really so presentable. He talks about all the distinctions that, that, that play a role. In fact, it kind of harkens back to the earlier comment he makes about there being both Greek and Jew, both slave and free. What's unique about what he's saying is this. There is a natural tendency when people are grouping for there to be this us and them mentality. And then you have people who kind of look at other people and because of some distinction or some demarcation, there's this kind of, well, you know, the rich people don't like hang, hang out with the poor people. And the poor people don't like the rich people. And the dark folk don't like the light folk. And life don't like the dark folk. And the heavy folk don't like the skinny folk. You know I'm trying to go with this. And the young folk don't like the old folk. And the old folk like the young folk. And everyone's got these kind of things about this. And Baptists don't like Kojics. And Apostolics don't like Presbyterians. And Church of God don't like Catholics. You know, you, I mean, all of these breakdowns, all of these things that, 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 that really are more div, 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 divisive than anything. And what, and what Paul is saying is like, look, we cannot begin to assign greater value to specific groups based on our own prejudices. Preach, pastor. It's very easy for us to look at certain groups, certain people, their place or station in life, and determine that they don't have the same worth or the same value as someone else. It's very easy to play into certain demographics or play in a certain you know, economic status. It's very easy to get kind of sidelined and push into these, these categories. And Paul is saying, no, 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 we can't do that because the minute you start talking like us and them, that's when division arises in your midst. The minute you start singling out groups and, and making certain groups that are stand out for different reasons, that's the minute division rises in your midst. In the early church, one thing that began to take place is that when they were handing out the daily rash to those that were apart, the widows and the orphans, the Bible says that the Hellenists or those that were not of Jewish descent were not getting their daily rash. There was, a, there was a church fight. In fact, the church first church fight was right down racial lines. The first church disagreement was actually a race issue because a certain ethnic group was not getting what another ethnic group was getting. And division arose in the church. That's where deacons came from. Bible says, the, the apostle said, look, we ain't dealing with that. Go get some folk that can wait table while we pray. What am I trying to say? That one of the things that has so captivated I believe the purpose and destiny of the body of Christ is that division has risen out of partiality. Certain people are better than other people. Certain people are more acceptable than other people. Let me say it this way. Certain sins are more acceptable than other sins. Preach, Pastor Jeremy. And we don't have a holistic approach to ministry because we've divided people up. And the Bible says if we're going to be a collective group, or we're going to be one body, there cannot be partiality. But we must appropriate value to every single person, blood wash or not. Every soul's got value. You're tracking what I'm saying. And in this place, part of the things that we've tried to do, in fact, one of the things that, I, that we've kind of been working through over the past five years is finding ways to even lessen the gulf and divide that exists between the clergy and the laity. So we don't sit chairs on the stage in our services. We don't wear a lot of clothing that demarks us as special or different. We don't use a whole lot of titles. When you meet me, I tell you, my name is Jeremy. It's not because I'm trying to just break tradition. What I'm trying to initiate in your thinking is that the same way God is using me, he's got an assignment for your life. And as I step into my calling, you got to step into yours. The fact is, part of what we try to do is break down the things that divide us. 
Because we know what happens is that when a little ounce of division, the seed of division, gets into the heart of a person, the harvest is almost uncontainable. And it's like the hat fills and McCoys. And people for long time, you know, long stints of time are in confusion and conflict because there was some level of partiality. And my hope and desire is that we not be that place, that we be a house where people can fellowship and be connected. And we may not agree and are not alike on every single thing, but there's a safety in the fact that there is liberty in this house to be unique, but to be a part. Is that making sense to you? And there's a mutual understanding of grace that as you are shown grace, you show it to somebody else. And when people are confusing to you, you show them mercy because you're going to be confused with somebody else. And when people don't understand you, they're going to show you the measure of mercy you showed somebody else. Preach, Pastor Jim. I know of people right now who in seasons where people were walking through struggles and heartache, they were cold-hearted, mean, rude, and snippy toward them. And then when they themselves walked through a season of hardship, they couldn't find nobody to have their back because they had alienated everybody else. Child of God, if we're going to receive grace, we got to give it. Here's the last one. Let me get out of your way. Number four is this. Both our highs and our lows are a shared experience. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul says, that when one of us is in sorrow, we all, we all are in sorrow. And when one of us is honored, we all rejoice. I thought about this when I was in my office between services, and I was thinking that, you know, it's, this is so true of the body, because you ever stomped your toe? And when you stomped your toe, your toe doesn't yell. Right? You stomp your toe, and your whole body gets involved in the catastrophe. <laughs> Doesn't it? You're like, oh my, you know, and you start saying things you, I can't really repeat right now in service, but you start hopping around your room, you know, and you start yelling out, why? Because when one part of you was in sorrow, all of you was in sorrow. You ever had a toothache? And, and you can't blink no more? Because it hurts to blink? The tooth hurts so bad, you just, I, I can't blink. There's nothing. You ever had, you had that kind of, you know, a headache, right? And you just mad at everybody that you know? Because your whole, your whole, the whole body responds. Same ought to be true in the family of faith. When someone in this house is in a season of trouble, it ought to matter to everybody. Right? When you're broken, we're all broken. When it hurts, it hurts us all. When your heart is in shambles, we're going to be there with you. Why? Because you matter. You're a part of us. And, 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 and what, you know, I said earlier, I said, I ain't never seen my right hand fight my left hand. It never happened. Because one body. Same thing is true for this, for this family. We have to be such a loving community that when one of us is in a difficult space, we are all in a difficult space. But conversely, when one of us is celebrating and honored in life, all of us are enthusiastic. The fact is, in connection and community, our lows aren't so low and our highs are so much higher. Because there's someone to share it with. When we're falling into a season, there's someone to break the fall. But when we're jumping, there's someone to lift us up. My hope and my desire for this house is that no matter where you find you, this place has to be a place of grace. So you're going to find yourself in some interesting spaces in life. And when you do, there's got to be some people around you that can cover you, that can keep you, that can hold you, that can hear you, that can know you. One of the great stories that wasn't told earlier about life group was the story of even one of our ministers to Gail, to Gail Brownlee, went into the hospital, and while she was there, her life group came to the hospital, and they were, they were just there. The whole group came over there, and, and she told me later on that her sister got upset because she wanted them to leave. And she, told, she said, listen, she, she told them, she said, listen, y'all supposed to come and pray and go, not pray and stay. And she had to kick the life group out of the room because they were so compassionate to their life group member that they spent time in fellowship with her. Don't you want to be known like that? Don't you want to be a part of a family that when something goes wrong, you're not out there swimming by yourself, but there is somebody looking in on you 
thinking about you, that comes from connection. That comes from us being a part of one body. Somebody stopped me a couple of years ago and said they were upset because they had missed church for, I imagine, maybe a few weeks or a few months, and no one had noticed or reached out to them. And, and I get complaints from time to time. I don't know why, because I'm doing such a great job, but anyway. <laughs> I get complaints, and so they were telling me how upset they were, you know, and they were just, just really bad. So, so I started asking them some questions. I said, okay, well, are you in a life group? No. I said, well, do you serve in any of the ministries here at the church? No. I was like, well, do you hang out? Do you, do you spend time? Do you, who, who are your people that you talk to after service in the, in the garden area? And, well, I don't, I don't stay after for that. I said, the reason, friend, <laughs> this is a true story. The reason that nobody missed you is because nobody knows you. It's not a criticism, it's a reality. If you are a part of a place and you choose not to connect in any meaningful way, there's no way for anyone to know that you are gone because they never knew that you were here. If you're the person, and I'm guilty of it from time to time, that goes home and before you get to your garage, you open it so that as soon as you drive up, it's coming up right at the same time. And then when you get in your garage, you hit the button again and close it. And you never come outside. You never talk to your neighbors. You never meet anybody. We can't have an expectation that anyone has a relationship with any meaningful attachment. Because we, we isolated ourselves. And my heart's desire, and the reason why we plan so much stuff, like the outdoor stuff and the picnics and the harvest fest and all the fun things that we do outside of the church experience is because I'm trying to create an environment for you to be known. People are not going to know you necessarily just sitting in church because you're all looking up here. But if you're out there in other places, connected, it allows for you to make meaningful attachments so that when you walk through difficult seasons, you've got a friend. Here's my hope. Stand to your feet. Here's my hope. My hope is that you realize that we are better together. That, that, that any ounce of an idea for us to be separated is an attack of the enemy on your well-being and your well with all. When the enemy tries to show you something or tease you with a thought that maybe someone has some odd intention towards you, that's Satan trying to break you down, trying to pull you apart, trying to break down your family, break down this house. We can't let Satan do that. We have to fight for us, fight for our connection, fight for our heart, fight for our unity, fight for our mission to be closer to people and closer to God. I don't know what your experience is, where you come from, or what you've been through, but I tell you this, here's what I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you need somebody else. I know it, that you need me, and I need you. That this life is impossible to live on your own. It gets lonely out there, and it gets scary. But when you got people that are with you, it just makes it better. It just makes it better. Two quick things before I let you go. Number one, some of you will know this name, Sister Norma Linton. I sent an email out this week. She went home to be with the Lord this past week suddenly. And so our hearts and our minds are with her family. She was a longtime member of this church and a very active supporter, was one on our staff for 20 or 30 years. And we are certainly saddened by her departure. But grateful that she's in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Number two, we um, have been impacted. And I, I sent an email out to you about the Harvey Relief uh, in Texas. Some of you have family down there. We've got some family down there. We know that those communities have been impacted in a way they did not anticipate. And we wanted, we wanted to be a blessing to them. And so I sent a message out to my staff, and I said, hey, um, I, want, I, want to, I want to invest in some help, but I got, two, I got two requirements as you look around for who we can support. The first is I don't want an organization that has too much administrative overhead costs. 
I don't want our dollars to get tied up in just paying people salary as opposed to really being able to do the work that's needed in such an emergency situation. But number two, I want an organization that is aware and sensitive to communities that are impoverished and communities that are, that are underrepresented. I think sometimes the relief effort that we see on television is not really representing the neighborhoods you and I know that really need special help. And so I, I want to find an organization that not solely, but that definitely had a sensitivity to in communities that, that are not as well off as other maybe suburban communities. So we thought like we found that in the communities, that, in the groups that we are supporting. And so you have a couple of options. Number one, you can just put something, and me and Asia are gonna give $100. We're gonna start off with $100, but you can um, do something in the, in the envelopes and put something in the, the bucket, I mean the box, but you, you gotta say on there, hurricane relief or Harvey relief, you know, or something along those lines so that we'll know that it's for that purpose. Or you can go to Push Pay our app, do the exact same thing, whatever you give. In the memo, make sure you say Harvey relief, hurricane relief, storm, put water, rain, you know, destruction, something that helps us to know that it's a problem. And so we can make sure every single dollar that you give goes to that purpose. Amen? Because we're a generous church, right? And I've said it before. The way that we build a financial hedge of protection around this house is by blessing people that don't live here. So when we invest in other people, in other communities, I do that God looks in on that because the Bible says that when we give to the poor, we are lending to God. He's the best investment. You follow what I'm saying? Now, I've said all of this stuff. Here's what challenges me as your pastor. Sometimes you all leave right out of church and go right to your cars and you speed home and wherever else you got to go. As opposed to spending some time getting to know some people that are part of this congregation. So here's what I want you to do. I don't want anybody to rush to their vehicle today. Yes, I'm talking to you. Because I already know you, you got your purse in your hand. You can't wait for me to say amen. You got the purse in your hand. And you, you're like, if you don't pray already, my crock pot is on. I just got to care nothing about your crock pot. That's your problem. You set it and forget it. It'll be there when you get there. Before you run to your car, all right, don't run to your car. I want you to go right outside these doors, and I want you to meet somebody, somebody that you don't know already. And it may feel awkward at first. You may feel weird like it's a school, like the Sadie Hawkins dance, something like that. I know. It's okay, though. Just introduce yourself. And even you put it on me. Hi, pastor is making me do this. My name is Billy. What's your name? So I can just put this down. Use me as a scapegoat. I don't mind. But meet somebody. All right? Now. I'm going to go to the parking lot right now and wait by your car. And if I see you running to your car, I'm going to roll up on you and ask you some tough questions about your future and your destiny. I'm revoking church membership today. Run to your car. You ain't a member no more. Let it be written. Let it be done. I'm right. I'm be right in the parking lot. Don't y'all be trying to run off. Meet somebody. People are generally nice, most of them. The ones who are not don't go here, all right? right. What are they showing up there on the screen? Oh, that's so cute. And they take a picture, <laughs> too, all right? Y- y'all gonna do that for me? I'm going to the parking lot right now, way by your car. Eric, why don't you pray the benediction?